it's an honor to give this presentation at one of the first semi-public events at NYU. It is a very difficult act to follow by the previous speaker of um, Jonathan Aitken. Um, I will try my best. Um, slight amendment, the uh, full title of my paper is From Tribe to State in Eastern Arabia, the Transformation of Political Structure in Five States of the GCC. However, this topic from tribe to state, I have excluded Saudi Arabia, so one of the GCC states, and I have drawn on material concerning the five GCC states that are left. For reasons of time, I will, however, concentrate on two of these five states. But five of the six member states of the GCC are the subject of this presentation. They comprise the state of Kuwait, state of Qatar, the Kingdom of Bahrain, the Sultanate of Oman, and the seven individual members of the United Arab Emirates. According to the fieldwork of Lorimer's Gazetteer, carried, carried out before 1907, almost all the estimated 760,000 people belong to one of the 260 named tribes of Eastern Arabia. Today's inhabitants of these modern states are not all descendants of this tribal population by a long way. All five states are now home, even if only temporarily, to a very large number of immigrants from neighboring countries and further afield. The total population of the GCC states, excluding Saudi Arabia, is currently estimated at about 22 million. As the originally tribal population is now in the minority in most of the region's societies, what is the function of tribe in a modern Gulf state? Is tribe defunct because there is state? Do tribe and state coexist? or has tribe merged into state? Is the authority of the tribal sheikh adapted to modern executive and administrative powers? Such questions fall for a description of some aspects of tri a tribal society. The families, which ranged with their animals over vast areas to secure benefits from scant resources, they were supported by a tribal relationship structure. These same structures endured for the sedentary population. Thus, for generations, the tribal structure was the only structure for this entire population of the area. The essential link between the individual and the tribe is kinship. The person's identity is def defined by membership to the group into which he or she was born and remains the bearer of rights and obligations. This self-identification through genealogical construct integrates every person into a family and every family into the tribe. This is why a woman does not take on her husband's name. She remains known as the daughter of her father and she always belongs to her birth family. What matters in the kingship system are not merely the component persons and groups, but rather the anticipated network of relationships between them and with an unknowing number of past and present, real or mythical, other members of the tribe. Security is of paramount importance to a tribal person. Economic security is guaranteed because the care of resources is shared, even when animals or other assets are individually owned. Wells are dug and maintained by the community. The tribal dar, that is the area, is watched over and defended by all able-bodied men. Even being completely alone in the desert, a tribesman felt, feels safe because his people are honor bound to look after him wherever he may be. That obligation of mutual defense also extended to the sea 
where an ever-increasing number of tribesmen engaged as cooperatives in seasonal purling during the summer. The tribal society may honor a member for many different reasons, such as descent, wisdom, religiousness, or being the father of many sons. But news of a person's physical prowess and daring travels furthest in the desert. Oppenheim, an early 20th century authority on Bedouin tribes, considered the power of public opinion as the most binding force in a nomad's way of life. Fear of being censored, reproached, or ridiculed by others is a strong incentive to strive to be as courageous, generous, hospitable, hospitable or selfless as is attributed to the best in his tribe. The tribe is a Rechtsgemeinschaft, an entity governed by a common set of unwritten rules. Their principles are well known to all the members. Reference to the legal practices of the forefathers adds to the tribe's identity and cohesion. The hierarchical order of society has a parallel in the jurisdiction. A minor dispute may be taken to the family elder, but in all serious disputes, it is the duty of the sheikh to dispense justice or to retain a qadi versed in religious law. A sheikh will be judged wise if he is seen to use the common understood, commonly understood tribal rules fairly to promote cohesion within the tribe and to avert dissent. There are also codes of contact which are shared between all tribal communities. They are essential to regulate interaction between different tribes and when a tribal individual meets members of unrelated tribes in the desert. Marriage is a matter which is strictly guided by the spirit of the tribal structure. The choice of a partner is an affair for the extended family and a marriage should comply with the expectations of the kinship group. This patriarchal society has always favored the father's brother's daughter as a married partner. If that is not possible, a suitable match could be found among other family members. But sheikhs and rulers may marry into other tribes for political reasons. Where status is so much a function of genealogy, marriage is key to the social status of a person. To safeguard the purity of the patrilineal descent for the next generation, social hierarchy prevails in marriage, even though in matters of daily life, social equality obtains. Families rank according to their lineage. There are noble families in every tribe. They provide leaders called sheikhs, one of whom is a paramount sheikh or later the ruler. This kinship, between, this kinship between status, this relationship between status and marriage prospect is of equally great importance to the nomadic as to the sedentary tribal society. In a tribal society, the individual partakes of a ready-made value system. It consists of the ethical frame for all behavior in which religion is also a component. Poetry is an important and much practiced transmitter of these traditional values, as well as of news and views. Poetry comments, praises, castigates, and blames real or imagined events. As for decision-taking in the context of the tribal unit, Dostal, another specialist, writes, the most important foundation of the tribal political organization is its democratic constitution, which is rooted in the social equality of the members of the desert community, as conceived in the patrilineal ideology. The system ensures not only that a person's voice is heard, it also implies the individual's duty to participate in common decisions 
and give his opinion. However, the principle of equality works hand in hand with the principle of seniority. Seniors are not only those who are the tribe's elders in age, but also those whose lineage is of a higher standing and has of generation, over generation provided the paramount shake. A majlis is where leading personalities in society make themselves regularly available for exchanging of views. The Sheikh's Majlis is where an individual may bring petition, make a complaint, ask for justice, or just air his views. This is where the leader would discuss issues of common concern with elders of the tribe and any other member. The traditional Majlis has the limited function of providing a forum for advice and a chance to influence decisions. It is not the vehicle for a formal, enforceable majority decision. It is the role of the leader to shoulder the ultimate responsibility for the tribe's common actions. The sheikh's executive power may take on quite autocratic aspects. Rulers can be merciless and unbending, but a tribal leader's authority is never unlimited. He should be aware that his position depends on those who had chosen him in the first place from among other possible candidates. When a sheikh dies, one of his sons may become the new ruler, but his brother or nephew may be chosen instead and should have at least some of the ideal quali qualities. He should be courageous, generous, hospitable, a good Muslim, and above all, a fair judge. It may not surprise that in almost all the tribal communities whose transition to statehood is being discussed here, that is all four of them, five of them, the ruling families have been in a leadership role as far back as the 18th century and beyond. I have tried here to show that tribe is self-sufficiently following its own economic, legal, ethical, and political norms. In the following, the modern state depends on universal legal, social, and, put, and political norms. It may be an uncomfortable home for a tribal society. In the following, it may become obvious that for each of these tribal societies, it was the presence or the interference of outside forces which caused the political and economic landscape to change, the one that I've described just now. Adapting to these changing conditions has to happen, had to happen in the case of this region in a short space of time, about six decades in the case of the UAE. Was it indeed a process of adaptation Kuwait may serve here as an example for the gradual process of the transition from a tribal society to a modern city-state, where the legacies of the structures of the past may still dominate the politics of the present. Over several centuries, nomadic Arabs gravitated from the center of the Arabian Peninsula on to the coast of the Gulf. During the course of the 18th century, they followed the trading opportunities in the Gulf and the flourishing demand for pearls. Conquering, holding, and expanding favorable coastal locations in Kuwait, Qatar, and Bahrain became the foundation for growing prosperity of these tribal communities. In 1752, the Utop on the coast of Kuwait's Kuwait chose Sabah bin Jaber as their tribal leader. leader. Descendants of the House of Al-Sabah have prevailed as a politically dominant family in Kuwait until the present. Attracted by the trade opportunities, merchants from elsewhere came to settle in Kuwait. They changed the character of this originally Bedouin society. The status of the tribal paramount sheikh was bound to change too when the income generated by these sedentary newcomers 
rivaled the nomadic tribe's traditional bells, which was counted in animals. These opportunistic outsiders, who became settled Kuwaiti merchants, have continued to cause problems for the sheikhs in the following years and decades. Another outside force, Britain, caused, Brit caused Kuwait's erstwhile tribal political system to be shaken up further. In the late 18th century, the British government in India had established a political representation in Bushir on the Persian shore. During the course of the 19th century, the British extended their influence ever more vigorously at the head of the Gulf into Persia and Mesopotamia. This brought them into conflict with the Ottoman Empire and its claims to parts of Arabia. Kuwait became a pawn in the international struggle for economic and strategic domination by rivaling powers, British, Turkish, Russian, German and others. While all this outside attention greatly increased the Sheikh's status, it alienated him from his role, his original role as a tribal leader. The tenure of Sheikh Mubarak bin Sabah, who ruled Kuwait from 1896 to 1915, is an example of a Sheikh becoming a domineering figure, not because of the prowess of the tribes of the tribes or the economic importance of the community, but because of the geographical lo location of his dominion. In 1866, Britain secretly concluded an called exclusive agreement with Sheikh Mubarak. This obliged him not to, I quote, cede, sell, lease, mortgage, or give for occupation any portion of his territory to a foreign power without prior permission from the British government. By the end of the 19th century, the Al-Sabah Sheikh was referred to as ruler or emir. Turkish and British authorities referred, conferred titles, honors, and medals on him. Kuwait thus became the fo focal point of outsiders' political interest as a possible endpoint for the Turkish-German Baghdad railway project. Where there had been a fluid influence from the Al-Sabah over neighboring tribes, the geographical extent of the ruler's authority was now hotly debated. This was, however, not yet the decisive state step towards a modern state without a, within agreed borders. That pro progress was set in motion in November 1922 during the conference at Oker to delineate the border between Ibn Saud's Rid and the British protected kingdom of Iraq. As a byproduct, the British High Commissioner in Baghdad, Sir Percy Cox, imposed part, a part of the borders for Kuwait and created the neutral zone. Now, the da of the nomadic tribal families of Kuwait had become the state of Kuwait. Their paramount sheikh had become the ruler. More than ever, this emerging state remained under the benevolent but firm tutelage of the British government. In December 1934, Sheikh Ahmed bin al-Jaber, Mubarak's grandson, awarded a concession to the newly formed Kuwait Oil Company, which belonged only half to uh, the British company, Anglo-Persian. It now became essential to fully define the territory under the sovereignty of the ruler. The crucial step, however, on the way to Kuwait's modern statehood was taken in June 1961 when the Emir Abdullah al-Salem declared Kuwait, Kuwait's independence of Great Britain. But because Baghdad immediately threatened to incorporate Kuwait into the Iraqi state, British military assistance was recalled until Egyptian troops of the Arab League 
could be deployed to help to guarantee the continued independence of the new state of Kuwait. The next step was that the Emir agreed on the 11th of November 1962 to the promulgation of a constitution with an elected constituent assembly. This event marks the conclusion of a development spanning half a century, during which time Kuwaiti merchants had become a pressure group distinct from the al Sabah clan on the one side and the families which identified themselves as tribal and pastoral on the other. It is therefore important to go back to events in the wake of the sudden collapse of the pearling industry and the growing self-confidence of Kuwait's merchants in their effort to modernize the modern political, the political landscape. In 1922, these merchants pressed the ruler to establish a consultative assembly of appointed members. But already after two months, he abolished it. After this setback, the merchants did not give up on their demand for a share of the decision-making process. Yet, they never went as far as wanting to abolish the rule of the al Sabah family altogether. By the late 1980s, 1930s, Sheikh ja Ahmed al Jaber realized that some concessions were unavoidable. And in 1938, he signed the foundation document for a consultative council consisting of 150 members elected from among the leading merchant and tribal families of Kuwait. But once this council got to work, it did not limit its reform to conditions related to trade. The council reached out to the rest of society with ideas of reform, reforming the legal system, education, health care, and an efficient police force. Seeing these measures as the thin end of the wedge, the ruler, with the agreement of British diplomats, decided to put an end to this council after six months. Such action was no longer the gamble. It might have been even some months earlier because the discovery of oil in commercial quantities in Feb February 1938 promised a future of financial independence as well as the assurance of British support to the ruling family while the merchant families saw their influence dwindle. Thus, the precursor of the Constitution of 1962 had not brought lasting political change to Kuwait yet. But in 1962, the Kuwaiti society became the first in the Gulf to live in what should be termed a constitutional monarchy of sorts, with the emir as and al Sabah as the head of the state. The society of Kuwait continued, however, to be defined by kinship. Kuwait's constitution gave the national, essentially tribal and merchant population, scope for political participation. But this constitution was also the vehicle to reserve the al Sabah family's hereditary right to monopolize the executive power. I will now turn to the making of the UAE. And here I am indebted to Zaki as well as Jonathan. Under 19, until 1971, the seven member emirates, which made up the federation of the UAE, were known as the Trucial States. What was that statehood like, if they were called the crucial states? Did tribes still play a role? And what changed in 1971? The seaboard between the Musandam Peninsula near Ras al Khaimah and Abu Dhabi is now almost completely urbanized. But before the 18th century, this coast was very sparsely populated. Before the arrival of the European powers in the 15th century, Arabs based in Muscat and on the island of Hormuz dominated carrying trade along the Gulf and as far as the Indian Ocean. 
In the second half of the 18th century, the Kawasim became the strongest competitors for the Omanis, for these Omanis, which had, had dominated the trade. This tribe, the, the Kawasim, now dominated harbors and islands on either side of the Gulf. The exploitation of the prolific pearling banks on the Arab side of the Gulf drew ever more nomadic tribal tribes from the hinterland to settle in the sheltered coastal inlets. They acknowledged the maritime Kuwasin as their distant overlords. But when the Kuwasim's natural competitor, Muscat and Omanis, became closely allied with the East Indian Company, the Kawasim attacked the leading vessels of their Omani competitors as well as the latter's British Indian allies. This provoked retaliation by the Bombay Marine, the naval branch of the com company. These clashes were felt throughout the Gulf as an intolerable disruption of the pearling industry. But even though the Bombay Marine had defeated the Kawasim in, in 1819 and burned their ships at Ras al Khaimah and other ports, it was not too difficult to force the defeated Arab maritime sheikhs of the Gulf to sign a peace treaty, which was then called a truce. The Arab signatories of this general treaty of 1820 were all lords of their respective maritime strongholds on the coast. Their territories became officially known as the Trucial States. I turn to Abu Dhabi as one of the important parts of this whole story. Abu Dhabi Emirate cover, covers 87% of the UAE's territory. This area has been the ancestral home of the Baniyas. They are considered a confederation of tribes which have for many generations acknowledged the leadership of one family, the Al Bufalah, later in the 1960s known as the Al Nahyan. The number of sub-tribes of the Baniyas fluctuates between 15 and 20, depending on the politics of each generation. The Baniyas shared Abu Dhabi's deserts with a number of other tribes, particularly the Manasir and the Awamir. Several centuries ago, the ancestors of the Baniyas discovered on their migration from Central Arabia that, due to some fluke of nature, sweet water can be found in the Liwa region, which is some 60 kilometers south of the coast. There, they, the Baniyas, planted date gardens and built houses from palm frond. About 50 of these settlements nestle among the huge dunes of the Rub al-Khali. They are spread in a semicircle along some 100 kilometers. This, the Liva, became the power base, refuge, and economic lifeline for the Baniyas and some other tribes. From there, the nomadic camel herders explored the coast and began to participate in the seasonal pearling. But this waterless coast abutting on these western deserts is shallow, tidal, and fringed by sterile salt flats, Sabka. It was therefore of momentous economic importance when potable water was discovered in shallow wells on the island of Abu Dhabi. This meant that by the 1760s, their tribal pearling cooperatives could base themselves in a place which was easy to defend and close to the pearling banks. In the, 19, in the 1790s, Sheikh Diab bin Isa recognized the economic importance of the, of the island. He made Abu Dhabi his capital and constructed a fort. From this fort in Abu Dhabi, successive Al Bufalah rulers projected their power towards other tribal communities along the coast and to the hinterland. They were in constant in contact with other regional powers and also with the British Indian authorities. The Banias Sheikh signed an 1820 treaty, and as a truthful state, 
Abu Dhabi shared the common history of the maritime principalities, aware that the peace on the sea would be enforced by some form of British military presence, military and political. Tribal pragmatism prevailed. Accommodating to the authority of this outside power was a possibility to end the destructive maritime raiding. The 1820 truce was followed by annual agreements, but in 1853, a perpetual treaty of peace was concluded between British India and the rulers of, in that case, seven crucial states. Throughout the 19th and for part of the 20th century, Britain stepped up her role of ubiquitous monitor of events in the Gulf, and the relationship became progressively intense, intrusive. Britain obtained signatures aimed at maintaining political, economic, or strategic domination, as, for instance, the prohibition of slave trade or arms trafficking. By the end of the 19th century, the British Indian government resented London's policy of free trade for all comers. Fear of competition from European powers caused the authorities in Bombay to persuade the rulers to sign the executive agreement which Sheikh Mubarak of Kuwait had already signed in 1899. Additionally, successive generations of rulers signed undertakings regarding oil concessions, telegraph lines, postal services, landing rights, rights for flying boats, refueling for aircraft on their way to India, or the jurisdiction over non-Muslims and others. In time, the coastal tribal sheikhs' commitment to an outside power, neither Arab nor Muslim, threatened to alienate them from their own people. On the other hand, the special relationship between the ruler and the mighty government of India added enormously to the stat status of a tribal sheikh, in particular when compared to the diminishing role of the leaders of once very powerful and numerous tribes of the hinterland. When more semi-nomadic families gravitated to the coast, they looked to the coast for economic betterment and associated themselves with the powers on the coast. So the sheikhs of the tribes in the hinterland lost status and eventually had to declare their loyalty to one of the coastal rulers. That was either to the Kavasim, or to the Baniyas rulers of Abu Dhabi and Dubai. Exporting pearls to India hugely stimulated imports. Wealthy merchant communities flourished in the crucial ports. Some merchants became much wealthier than their rulers and lent money to them. As in Kuwait and Bahrain, so also in the crucial coast, the merchants were mostly content to leave the political power in the hands of the rulers, as long as there was no interference with their economic issues. But in the late 1920s, the market for pearls, for Gulf pearls was suddenly ruined by cheap cultured pearls from Japan. And the world economic recession further contributed to the collapse of the market in luxury items. Dubai, the crucial state where the decline of trade was felt most acutely, experienced serious internal problems in the 1930s, similar to those of Kuwait. The merchants resented the fact that the finely balanced political climate was disturbed when the ruler became wealthier through payment of oil concessions. But also this matter of oil concessions was a bone of contention between the merchants and the rulers. One after another of the rulers did sign agreements with oil exploration during the 1930s. The British government ensured that negotiations were conducted with only one company, the Petroleum Development Crucial Coast, PDTC, a wholly owned daughter of the IPC, Iraq Petroleum Company, which held concessions in Iraq, Qatar, Oman, and elsewhere in Arabia. The matter of oil concessions continued to influence the political landscape. 
When, the, for instance, the ruling family of Kalba on the Indian Ocean coast died out in 1951, the region was integrated into the state of Sharjah. But already in 1952, the territory, this same territory, of, which covered Fujairah was taken away from the ruler of Sharjah and Fujairah was declared a trucial state. The newly proclaimed trucial ruler, Sheikh Mohammed al-Sharqi, had all along been the acknowledged leader of the tribes of the Sharqiin, which was very numerous and cohesive. He signed a concession agreement, or a concession agreement. In the event, the company could not make use of any of these concessions, which were obtained in the 1930s, until long after the Second World War. During the war, there was neither capital nor manpower or steel available to start serious exploration, let alone drilling. It came at the right moment for the impoverished population of the Drusal states that the money which the rulers were paid for oil concessions began to circulate in the souks, and some people even found employment with the companies. Others sought work in oil fields of Kuwait, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and in particular in Qatar. Their experiences, where they came from, fed the expectations at home of the good life which would come once oil was found and money would flow in. It was therefore unimaginable that the seven rulers would, in the, in, in the event, act differently to those in Kuwait or Qatar and not take the income, incoming money in hand to improve the lives of their fellow citizens. When finally in February 1950 drilling did begin in Ras Zada on the coast of Abu Dhabi, the long-awaited certainty was not yet over. The well was the deepest ever drilled in the Middle East. It cost one million sterling, but no oil was found. Ten years later, after working in several other parts of the Trucial States, PDTC could announce in October 1960 that oil had been found in commercial quantities in the west of Abu Dhabi. An export from its onshore fields began in 1963. Eventually, PDTC cancelled all the concessions which it had concluded with the other crucial rulers and concentrated on Abu Dhabi. These relinquished concessions were taken up by other oil companies. Most had little success, except particularly an offshore Dubai, which became an oil exporter in 1967. Since the independence of India in 1947, the British government exercised her influence in the Gulf from the so-called political residency in Bahrain. The British government became concerned about the lack of security for geologists and other oil company personnel who needed to travel in the hinterland. This led to the establishment in 1949 of the so-called Trucial Oman Scouts, a British officered force of recruits mostly from Aden, Oman, and later the Trucial States. They patrolled the countryside while the ruler's guards kept peace in the towns. This small force was the first of many initiatives which the British government undertook during the 1950s and 60s to mitigate criticism at the United Nations for not doing enough for the material and social betterment of people under their care. Therefore, Britain made an effort to provide semi-skilled, skill-based educational and infra infrastructure project projects with some British personnel who also became involved in the day-to-day -day running of some of the individual states. Interaction between the, seven, between the seven ruling families continued to follow the pattern of tribal alliances involving messages, visits, meetings for, for weddings and condolences. Notoriously avid for news, which traveled by word of mouth everywhere, and poetry, 
the population followed what, change, what changes was happening in any of the seven states and their neighbors. Thus, the change of ruler in Abu Dhabi in July 1966 was welcomed not only by the leaders of the Baniya sub-tribes, but this had an echo throughout the region. Since 1928, Sheikh Shahbud bin Sultan al Nahyan had steered Abu Dhabi's fortune from the pearling boom through the years of bitter economic da downturn. In 1939, he haggled with the oil company for the best possible terms, only to wait, together with the ever more anxious population, for the moment when Abu Dhabi would finally join other oil exporting Gulf countries, inshallah. It was only in the year 1962 when this was possible. Where, then, wary of how long this bonanza would last, Sheikh Shahbud carefully weighed every development proposal. He was seen as too hesitant. By not rushing to follow examples like Qatar or Kuwait on a bold curve of developmental change. His younger brother, Sheikh Zayed, had for 20 years represented the ruler, his, his brother, in the eastern region of Al Ain. He made his name for himself as an effective communicator with the tribes of the region and neighboring Oman. He was generous with the little money available and managed to better the lives of people with projects such as, for instance, improving the provision of water. In July 1966, the family decided to replace Sheikh Shahbud and make Sheikh Zayed the ruler of Abu Dhabi. This was done with the agreement and some support from the British. Immediately, Sheikh Zayed made his mark by accelerating the pace of development in Abu Dhabi. And he did not neglect his neighbors. He increased substantially Abu Dhabi's share to the Trucial States Development Fund. This fund was set up in 1965 to channel in a structured way the money which had, given, had been given over several years by Britain, Kuwait, Bahrain, and Abu Dhabi. Oversight of allocations was in the hands of the Trucial States Development Council of Rulers. A brainchild of the British resident in Bahrain in 1952. This council was meant to bring the seven rulers together in a structured manner and to discuss development projects. It, it also, this council also vetted the functions of a few specialists in the administration of the development office in Dubai. Initially, the Trucial States Council of Rulers meetings were chaired by British political agent who was in 19, since 1954 residing in Dubai. From 1965 onwards, the chairmanship of this council rotated among the seven rulers. In these formal meetings, formal meetings, the rulers and their entourage got to exchange views about issues concerning their individual states. But the elephant in the room was always the question of whether and how to formalize some common, a common action in some core kind of political unit. But this was not the time to think of throwing off the British protection. Britain was living up to her obligation of defending these states from encroachment, as in the case of Saudi designs on Baremi, and also keeping Ba'athists and other ideologies at bay. In, 19, in the 1960s, some British or pro-Nasserite sentiments made the rounds in Sharjah and elsewhere among educated people of the Trucial Coast. The formation of the UAE, the, the, in, the event which redirected the course of history for the Trucial States had absolutely nothing to do with developments in the Gulf. It was not the wishful thinking of either the rulers or the population. Yet, this event had transformative impact and the result partly was also the formation of the United Arab Emirates. 
the British government under the Labour Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, saw Britain's future in Europe. Influenced by the trade unions, it decided in 1966 to get rid of all the expensive military presence east of Suez. In November 1967, it assured the rulers of the Gulf that Britain would keep to her treaty obligations of militarily protecting and diplomatically representing Bahrain, Qatar, and the seven crucial states. In January 1968, the same official visited all the Gulf rulers and the Shah of Iran to praise them of the change of policy. British protection would be gone by the end of 1971. This unilateral abrogation of a century and a half's worth of treaties shocked British conservatives. They argued that long, at long last the city would reap some benefit from Britain's ties with the newly oil-rich states of the Gulf. The rulers voiced their dismay about the sudden change of direction and the limited time frame given to arrange for full statehood. There is a already now familiar narrative of when Sheikh Zayed reacted immediately and met on the 18th of February, 1968, with Sheikh Rashid, as we have heard from uh, Jonathan, with Sheikh Rashid at the border between Abu Dhabi and Dubai. They agreed there and then to join their two states together with regard to many political functions. Most importantly, they invited the rulers of the other crucial states and Qatar and Bahrain for a meeting on the 25th of February, 1968 in Dubai. What is le less well known, but we have heard about it now this morning from Zaki, is that there followed more than three years of extremely complicated and intensive work on crafting a unified state for nine individual emirates. All aspects of statehood for the union of the nine had to be agreed and written into a constitution. During more than three years, the nine rulers, their deputies, members of the ruling families, numerous court officials, and Arab and Western advisors met multiple times under conditions for travel and communication, which would now be considered archaic. His Excellency Ahmed Khalifa al suedi who later became the UAE's first foreign minister, had a leading advisory role among the handful of university-educated nationals who were all drafted in to work day and night on this project. In the summer of 1971, Bahrain withdrew from these negotiations and declared full independence. Qatar followed on the same route. And the state of Abu Dhabi got a cabinet and a 50-member strong advisory council. Now with Bahrain and Qatar gone, out of the political equation, little time was left for the seven crucial states to determine for themselves how to face the future. At this moment, the routine meet meetings of the Trucial States Council of Rulers provided a workable platform for these urgent discussions. These seven rulers began a routine meeting of the Trucial States Council in, in Dubai on the 10th of July, 1971. The breakthrough came on the 18th of July, 1971, when six of the rulers put their signature to the provisional constitution of the United Arab Emirates. Ras al Khaimah held off but joined the following February. On the 2nd of December, the UAE was declared an independent sovereign federation. As the highest decision making body, the Supreme Council of Rulers voted for Sheikh Zayed to become the president for the first five years. On this occasion, the representative of the British government, Sir Geoffrey Arthur, and President Sheikh Zayed signed a treaty of friendship before the national flag of the UAE was hoisted. During the first months of the existence of brand new federal ministries, the fledgling administration of the old development office served to launch the daunting work of building an administration and to reach all corners of the UAE. 
while there were no, not even any paved road to connect these Emirates. The task of rolling out federal administration was financed entirely by Abu Dhabi. The population in all the Emirates saw that roads, schools, hospitals now came their way thanks to the federal ministries, which were still manned mostly by foreign administration, administrators, Arab and others. However, the ruling families in each of the seven Emirates did not suddenly become just local governors. On the contrary, they continued, they continued to be seen as the facilitators for all development change. Sheikh Zayed made sure that the rulers of smaller emirates had the funds to respond to people's expectations. Thus, the, peop the pattern of people identifying strongly with their own emirate and its ruling family never disappeared. When we look at the individual emirates now, five decades into the life of the UAE, it is stunningly obvious that every one of the seven regions has not only preserved, but massively enhanced its own particular character and role. Some emirates built on geographical advantages, such as Fujera as one of the world's largest bunkering ports, or Ras al Khaimah with, with a pharmaceutical industry, or its mountain tourism. Culture has become Sharjah's calling card, and modern Dubai intends to outshine rivals on many continents. The motor for building these individual econo economies was, and is, the leadership of each and every ruling family. In coordination with the local ex and expatriate businessmen and the rest of the Emirates population. What is the rule of tribe in state of the Gulf in the 21st century? Where there is a constitution in the UAE, Kuwait, and Bahrain, the role of the ruler is an integral part of this document, these documents. His or their position emanate from the leadership structure, which is of tribal origin. Tribe has there, therefore structurally been integrated into the state. Does this help or hinder the relationship between the governments and the governed in these five states? In all five states, this relationship hinges on every ruler's personality. The modern tribal leader in the Gulf aspires to being a father figure in con consultation and in touch with the population, not an autocrat or a military dictator. In daily life, the local populations see their cities are populated by the numerically overwhelming majority of expatriates. It is therefore not surprising that these local populations continue to identify as members of tribally defined groups and are loyal to their own accessible rulers. For many people, the rulers and their families stand for a new way, for a way of life in which they and their families have their places and they can interact in their accustomed and traditional manner. In the eyes of some young Emiratis or Qataris, for instance, some of the rulers are seen as dynamic leaders for a modern future. Considering that in each of these states, the expatriate majority have no formalized place in the political structure, the tribal elements in the modern states of the Gulf can provide stability and social peace to the permanently resident section of society, the local population. Maybe I should add here that this is drawn from um, a body of work that I have done in more detail about all these five states, but I thought it was opportune to not go through all of this and rather concentrate on two aspects, two geographical areas of this work. Thank you.